today's topic is you know what volunteers want, um, how to create moments that matter to deepen engagement. And so uh, super excited to have Mallory here with us today. Um, my name is Gung. Um, I'm the co-founder and CEO here at Civic Champs. Um, you know, we're, uh, uh, for those of you that might not know us as well, right, we're a volunteer management software platform. Um, and so, you know, I'm sort of a serial entrepreneur and, you know, this is by far my, my, my favorite sector to serve. And so always excited to be able to add value in some way. Um, and then Mallory is, um, is our guest for today. Um, she is the, uh, course creator for, for her, um, awesome, uh, training uh, program called Power uh, Partners Formula, um, and she also is a host of um, a podcast called What the Fundraising, and so I encourage folks to check that out. Um, and I'll let sort of Mallory talk a little bit about herself, but she has a incredibly rich uh, sort of background in nonprofit uh, marketing, and I think is one of the best presenters I've seen. So, Mallory... Oh my gosh. Well, don't, you know, don't set the bar too high. <laughs> um, but thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here with all of you today to get to talk about what your volunteers really want and how to create these moments that matter that deepen engagement. If we have never met before, I'm Mallory. Um, and I, like many people, um, became, oh, it looks like part of my slide got cut off. Um, I became an accidental fundraiser, an accidental volunteer coordinator, in many ways, like an accidental nonprofit leader. Um, I fell in love with the nonprofit sector, something I would thought I was trying out for a few years before going back to law school or public policy school. Um, and I just, I fell in love with the sector and I never left. Um, but as I started to get promoted up into different roles or started to wear multiple hats, I had this really complicated reality where I felt this pressure to put on this presentation everywhere that everything was under control and everything was running really smoothly. But the reality was that running this nonprofit was a constant hustle. And I was working, you know, 12 to 15 hour days. Sometimes I didn't, when it came to fundraising, have a donor pipeline that I trusted. Um, I was sacrificing a lot of my personal life and health um, for the organization. And I hit a really, really serious, I, show this slide in a joking way, but it was a really serious moment of burnout for me. And I know many people who are coming to this um, call today have different positions inside their organization, whether they're in a fully volunteer coordinator role or they're the executive director, maybe they're the development director that runs some of their volunteer opportunities. And I know that this challenge hits everybody um, in different ways. And so I got to this moment where I was like, I don't know if I can keep doing this. Like, I don't know if I can stay in this sector and keep doing this, but I knew I loved it. And I wanted to figure out a way to make it more sustainable for me. And for me at the moment, the biggest thing that was um, really burning me out was fundraising in particular. And I ended up having this combination of life experiences. I got trained as an executive coach. I got certified in habit and behavior design, and I got trained in design thinking. And those frameworks, though they were not tied to my fundraising or nonprofit leadership specifically, they were actually about programming things that I was involved in. They radically shifted the way that I showed up as a nonprofit leader, as a fundraiser, as a volunteer manager, all of the different hats that I was wearing. And that's what led to the creation of my signature program, which is called the Power Partners Formula, which is really the combination of all of those frameworks with whatever strategic initiative you're talking about. So whether you're talking about fundraising, whether you're talking about volunteer management. And so everything that we're going to be talking about today comes from that framework, comes from inside that course. So I'm going to be talking to you about you know, creating engaging volunteer experiences, creating these moments that matter from the position of an executive coach, from the position of a habit and behavior designer, and a nonprofit executive leader. So you're going to get each part of that. Um, and it might be a new orientation to how you think about how you best support and engage your volunteers. Because the very first piece of how you create moments that matter for your volunteers starts with you and what's happening inside your brain and body as the nonprofit leader that you are. 
So in executive coaching, really one of the things that we deeply understand is that everything we do, every action that we take starts with having awareness around our emotions in that moment. So the core of coaching is really based on this um, idea of the cognitive behavior loop. That's the image that you're seeing in front of you. And that this is the idea that our thoughts and our beliefs inform how we feel and then ultimately how we show up and that impacts our results. So I'm gonna say that again, our thoughts and our beliefs inform how we feel and then ultimately how we show up and that's what impacts our results. And so this has so many different layers here, right? And I often give an example that's outside of the nonprofit sector to really try to drive this point home. You know, many years ago, I was speaking to a group of um, students and parents about test anxiety. And I said, you know, chemistry is not stressful. And everyone sort of like looked at me sideways and was like, that's why we're here, Mallory. And I was like, no, you know, chemistry is just chemistry. Like some students love chemistry, some students hate chemistry, but chemistry is just chemistry. What's stressful are the thoughts and the beliefs that you're holding about chemistry. I'm bad at science, so I'm going to be bad at chemistry. I did poorly on the last test, so I'm going to do poorly on this test. The teacher likes Johnny so much better than me. Those thoughts and those beliefs are what make chemistry stressful. And the same thing is true about fundraising, about other pieces of our nonprofit leadership, about our volunteer management. Oftentimes, it's not the thing that is so stressful, but the thoughts and the beliefs that we hold about it. Our volunteers don't want a volunteer workday that's that long. We're, we're, we can't put them in that environment because of blank. They're going to be mad at us if we do this. We've asked for too many things in a row because of blank. These narratives that we haven't actually collected data around, but we've made up some stories around, are actually what create a lot of our stress going into these situations. And so so we're going to talk about specific strategies today around engagement for your volunteers, but I want you to keep this in mind because oftentimes we end up holding ourselves back because of the thoughts and beliefs that we sort of project out into the way that we manage and run things and show up. And then that really, when we talk about engagement, when we're talking, you know, I love the words that you guys put around how your volunteers feel after working with your organization. I saw words like connection and community and and purpose. All of those words come from feelings. They come from experiences, right? And those experiences have a lot to do with how we as the leaders show up to those experiences, our energy transfers. And so once we understand that a little bit better, we realize how important it is for us to have an understanding of the thoughts and beliefs that are driving our emotions and ultimately our energy. And with fundraising in particular, although this applies directly to volunteering, when I started to look at my own cognitive behavior loop and I realized, okay, I was so uncomfortable fundraising. I was so nervous. I wanted to throw up before every major donor meeting. And I was like, okay, so why is that my emotion? Why is that, why is that the emotion I'm holding around fundraising? And I realized it was because I thought that fundraising was, you know, hounding people for money, begging people to do something they didn't really want to do. And I was trying to figure out the exact right way to get them to do it. And I think sometimes we feel like this in our volunteer engagement as well, right? We feel uncomfortable asking and we don't, we're not really sure if the other person wants to do what we want them to do. And those thoughts and those beliefs drive a lot of how we ultimately show up. And so for me with fundraising, one of the things that really shifted fundraising for me was when I chose a different thought and belief. And I was like, okay, well, what is really good fundraising feel like? What's really happening when fundraising feels like I'm in a flow connected state? And it was that, you know, great fundraising is not an ask, it's an offer. It's an invitation. It's about collaboration and vulnerability and connection. It's one form of partnership, just like volunteering. And so it can be easy in the grind of the day-to-day -day, or maybe after you've had a bad experience with a volunteer to like fall into some of those like negative or limiting beliefs. And it's so important to like orient yourself around a mantra that feels true for you that really helps you tap in to thoughts and beliefs that are going to help you feel empowered and confident in your role with your volunteers. Okay. Oh, I'm getting excited. Um, okay. 
So, and I'm sorry if I get a little out of breath. If you do not know, I am um, 27 weeks pregnant and the baby is taking a lot of my lung space. So if I have to pause at certain points and take a few deep breaths, please have a little, have a little compassion with me. Um, so let's talk about the different ways that we can sort of have a better understanding of how we create these experiences that matter and how we connect to people with where they're at. So everybody is wearing different colored glasses. Some of you are wearing red glasses. Some of you are wearing green glasses. Some of you are wearing blue glasses. I'm wearing purple glasses. And we all see the world through our lenses, right? And our colored glass are our perceptions and beliefs and thoughts. All of those things impact how we see the world and how we experience um, what we're experiencing. One of the ways that helps the clients that I work with really understand the lens that they're wearing, which is not always the same lens, right? We're always changing and shifting, is this idea of our energy leadership. So I got trained as an executive coach through an organization called IPEC, um, which talks about energy leadership. And there are these two types of energy that we feel, we experience. I'm not going to get all woo-woo here, I promise. But there are these two primary types of energy that we experience in the work that we're doing. One type of energy is called catabolic energy. Catabolic energy is a really depleting, defeating energy. It's filled with a lot of dread and resistance. Anabolic energy, on the other hand, is a really flow state energy. It's fueling, healing, regenerative. It's where we experience a lot of that joy and connection. Those words you guys put in the chat, those are that's anabolic energy. And consistently throughout our day, we are moving between these different levels of energy. And I'll talk about that in a moment. And like I said before, our energy is contagious, right? And so when we're thinking about how we create experiences that really, you know, deepen our engagement with volunteers, this is a really helpful framework to sort of understand that. So I want you just for a moment for yourself to sort of tap into how this energy shows up for you or has showed up for you. So when recall when you most recently experienced catabolic energy, that's that resistance, that dread, that like, oh, we have to do this again. Um, think of for a moment just about what was the experience? What did that energy feel like for you? And then how did it influence your performance? And maybe even instead of just the word performance, like how did it influence how you engaged or connected with your volunteers? I just want you to tap into that for a moment when you most recently experienced something like this. And then I want you to do the same thing for anabolic energy. I want you to recall when you most recently experienced anabolic energy. What was that experience, that flow state, that connection, that joy that felt really rejuvenating or healing? Maybe you led a volunteer work day and it was only supposed to be two hours and all of a sudden, like it was two and a half hours and you didn't know where the time went because everybody was like really connected and in that flow state. I want you to think about what that energy felt like and how it influenced the engagement of your volunteers, how it influenced your performance that day and really the overall experience. We get so caught up in the like, what are we doing, right? When we think about, when we think about curating a volunteer work day, we think so much about the logistics of that curation, right? The pieces of that. And I'm not saying those things are not important. You're like, Mallory, you apparently have never volunteered 250 people at once. I have, it's very hard, lots of logistics, totally get it. But what we don't often focus enough about are these pieces, because these are the pieces that actually really influence the experience. The logistics are important to keep things under control, to make sure the outcomes of the event are what you need them to. But when we talk about like how people leave your events feeling, it has a lot to do with the energy in this space, which a lot of times comes from you as the volunteer manager, as the volunteer leader, or your staff. And so these catabolic and anabolic energy, they exist on a spectrum. And inside IPEX course, they talk about this, these seven styles of leadership. We won't go into these in detail, but it can just be really helpful. And, and we'll share the slides with you after. So don't worry if you're like screenshotting or any of those things, we'll give you these slides. But just to know that we're always a combination of different energy levels and we're never one thing. I think about those old boom boxes with the lights flickering up and down. We're consistently moving between energy levels. And maybe five minutes before your volunteer workday, you get some really bad news about lunch not showing up. 
it makes perfect sense that in that moment, you're going to experience some catabolic energy, right? You're going to experience some like, oh my gosh, how am I going to handle this stress energy? What's helpful about understanding this spectrum is to know that you have choice, is that you have options to move into higher levels of energy to understand, ooh, yeah, that came in, that's stressful. What are some of the thoughts and beliefs I might be holding about that? And then what does it look like for me to move out of that energy, right? And we could spend another four hours talking about the strategies that help you move from catabolic energy into anabolic energy. But the most the most important thing I want you to walk away with just from today before we walk into these strategies is just the awareness around it, just the awareness around your energy in those moments and starting to think about and notice the thoughts and the beliefs that are leading to these moments that feel really stressful, that are creating a lot of resistance and Red versus those moments where you're able to feel really connected um, to your volunteers. And I'll make sure if you're like, okay, Mallory, this is a totally new type of like framework or thinking from me. Don't worry. I'm going to leave a lot of time at the end for questions. So jot them down. We'll have time to talk together um, about these things, but I wanted to just sort of present that um, the framework itself. So you can start to think about how this might be showing up for you. Okay. Um, the other thing I'll say is that, you know, a lot of times when we are in the grind of something, so if you, I don't know how many volunteer, actually throw in the chat, how many volunteer events you usually coordinate or your organization coordinates per year. I'm just curious, just throw the number in the chat if you want. Um, let's see, let's see 15, so, and there's no right or wrong answer here. I'm just sort of curious about the volume. Um, but I know that for folks who are doing like repeat volunteer events, oh my gosh, 48, okay, holy moly. Um, that a lot of times we can sort of get into, I don't even want to use the word ruts, but like we can just get into routine, routine around those um, events where we start to use a lot of our level three leadership, which is defined by rationalization, right? We're sort of like, everything's fine. We're coping. This is just the way it is, or this is just the thing we do. And we, we, you know, we rinse and repeat those volunteer opportunities, but we're doing it because we're in this routine of it as opposed to really thinking that for us, this might be the 25th event of the year, but for those volunteers, it might be their very first. And so what's really helpful when I think about these, these seven styles of leadership, what I think about a lot is like, okay, where am I falling into kind of rationalization, routine, just sort of coping, getting things through, where really the opportunity here can be at a higher level of energy, can have more anab anabolic energy. And one of the energies in particular that your volunteers are looking for is that level five energy, which is like opportunity focused, win-win, solution focused. Level four is also helper energy and care and all of those things. Everyone in the nonprofit sector, all of your volunteers, without even giving you all assessments, I can tell you your level four is off the charts. I've done this assessment for hundreds and hundreds of people. It's fascinating the way that folks inside the nonprofit sector are off the charts in their level four. And so, of course, your volunteers are coming with the orientation to help, right? They want to be helpful, but also what they're really looking for is like a deeply connected experience, right? They're looking for that that win-win, that opportunity, joy, and connection. And those things are happening at even those higher levels of anabolic energy. And so one thing, this isn't a tip that's in the deck, but that I'd really encourage you to do before you go into every volunteer opportunity or volunteer engagement is just to spend a moment and like do a little energy scan of yourself, of your staff team, around how you're walking in and just remembering for that moment that this might be your 24th, it might be your 100th or your 200th thing. But for some of the folks who are walking into their that room, it's their first and they're going to match your energy. They're going to meet you where you're at. And so taking that moment to get yourself into their lens, into their perspective, and up into the energy you want them to bring to that volunteer experience can be really helpful. Okay, 
we probably don't want to stop for questions right now, though there's a part of me that's like, if you guys have any questions, stop me. Um, but so feel free. If you do have questions, you can throw them in the chat, but we'll I'll answer them at the end as well. But we're going to start to move into kind of the behavioral science around volunteers. So everything we talked about before is really important because of what I said before, that people are looking for real connected experiences. And that has so much to do with how we show up into our leadership role, into our volunteer management role. And so talking about what's happening inside of us, inside of our energy, inside of our brains is so important to that, right? It's a big part of why I didn't want to just start with, okay, here are the strategies around what to do with your volunteers. But let's talk about what your volunteers really want. What are the reasons that they're deciding to work with your organization, to be involved with their organization, to do these volunteers event? these volunteer events. So there are four primary things that really like humans are looking for in this type of connection. Belief that their involvement matters, positive memories with the organization, a sense of belonging to the right group, and a connection to their personal identity. So these are the things that they're both looking for in deciding their initial engagement with your organization, and they're looking to be, oh, learning something is a great one. And they're looking to be validated in their engagement with you. And I'm sure, Martha, that I'm missing other ones too. And these are actually, what I'll say about these four things is that these, these four things are actually mostly like the subconscious things that they're looking for, right? So a volunteer can say, like, I'm looking to help, or I'm looking to learn something, or I'm looking to make an impact in my community, right? Like the words that they're using when they're talking about what they want in their volunteer engagement are different than this list. This is like, what is their like subconscious desires around working with your organization versus another organization? And what are the types of experiences that can validate that your organization was the right one for them to work with? And yes, sure, some people like to box food at a food bank and other people like to work out in a garden. And there's like the tactical side of what people are looking for in terms of their volunteer work. But in terms of their like deeper identity and engagement, and connection. These are the subconscious things that we're looking for when we're deciding this is where I volunteer, right? Like I'm a volunteer for this organization in this way. And these are the types of things that get validated through volunteer experiences that make a really big dis difference on whether or not they come back, whether or not they become more engaged, whether they sometimes become donors, whether they become staff members longer term, right? Like this, the whole point of this webinar is like around deepening engagement. And these are the types of things that really move that volunteer into a deeper form of engagement with your organization. So I'm going to give you just a few examples of sort of like how this how this shows up. And I'll share some studies that that demonstrate these facts. Okay, <clears throat> so belief that their involvement matters. So one of the things that's really important about this is that in our volunteer recruitment, and this happens in fundraising too, like we say a lot of things about why their involvement matters, right? And what their involvement in this volunteer opportunity is going to provide or is going to solve or is going to do. It's so important that we are matching the language that we're using with how we're going to treat them and with the activities that they're actually involved in. So one of the things that we've seen is that volunteers and, and funders, they really make a distinction between words like show your support versus make a difference. Right. So there was a study done. This was around fundraising in particular, but it applies directly to volunteers where they use the exact same copy in a fundraising appeal letter. But the the call to action in one of the emails was show your support. The call to action in the other email was make a difference. They did an A-B test. And when they used the term show your support, what they found was that more people were donated, but they donated smaller amounts. When they used make a difference, less people donated, but they donated larger amounts. So what does this tell us? This tell us that, that language like show your support 
makes people feel like there's a wider range of how they can show their support, right? They can show their support maybe through a volunteer activity that's 15 minutes, 30 minutes, writing a letter to a beneficiary, donating an item to something that they care about, right? They can show their support in, a, in an expansive variety of ways. But to really feel like they're actually making a difference that needs to be more significant to them, whether that's in time, in money, in the depth of their engagement. And so I think inside, we want to be careful. And, and you know, <laughs> folks can see through when we're like, make a difference with this five minute single phone call, you know, and, and folks get skeptical. They're like, how is that really going to make a difference? And so we want to use words that are are appropriate for the level of engagement that we're asking for. This helps build trust with our volunteers. It helps build trust with our donors. And it helps to make sure that the behaviors that they're taking are matching the language that we're using. So that's just one example. They want to deepen their belief that their involvement matters. And one of the ways that we do this is by being, being honest and being sort of connected in the language that we're using and how we're actually engaging them in something. The second is like positive memories with the organization. So there's this great, it's a fundraising book, but there's this great book by um, Francesco Ambergetti called Hooked on a Feeling, where he talks a lot about the psychology of giving. And he talks about this theory, and I'm forgetting the scientist who actually came up with the original theory. They talk about how memory is cemented through peak and end moments. Okay, so memory is cemented through peak and end moments. And so part of how we create relationships with our volunteers, with our donors, are through creating these peak moments. And one of the things that creates peak moments is any type of personal connection to that moment. So when it comes to fundraising, for example, like allowing somebody to give or do or say something personal in addition to their money has been shown to create a much higher retention rate. So the way this volunteers directly to how we think about volunteers is I think sometimes we feel like, oh, we don't want to ask them for more, or they're already doing this thing. So we don't want to ask them to bring a donation of their own as well. But what the data really shows is that anytime somebody connects something personal to themselves, to the work that they're doing or to what they're giving, their engagement in that thing is deepened. So there have even been studies that like when somebody was making a donation, they were asked to leave a pen that was meaningful to them in addition to their donation, and that drastically increased their retention rate. So maybe you have a volunteer work day where people are assembling, you know, food at a food bank and you have them bring with them their favorite, you know, canned something that they, and you start the volunteer day with everybody sharing the can that they brought as their donation before they even go into that assembly line, right? That's an example of creating positive memories and it starts to build into that identity piece as well because they've now connected something personal to themselves to the work that they're doing with you that day. And again, like we, when we think about that cognitive behavior loop, we often think, we often have some limiting beliefs around, um, you know, we don't want to ask them for more. Like they've already said yes to doing this thing. We don't want to ask them for more, but the data suggests over and over and over again, that this is what people want. They want to be invited to create a personal connection between what they're doing and their own lives and what's important to them. Um, and then, you know, you hear this all the time, but like as much as possible, making thank yous personal and warm and connected, those really help cement memories. They really help create that a really healthy peak moment or end or end. So like when people, you know, empower partners, when people finish their first year of the, of my program, they can either renew and, and stay in or they leave for everybody who leaves. I send them a personal video just like thanking them for being a part of it for the last year, really connected to their experience. That end moment is really important, right? To stay connected to folks inside that end moment. And so thank yous, gratitude play an important role in that as well. Okay. 
Okay. I'll try to slow down a little bit too. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> so the third piece here is this sense of belonging to the right group. So whether you're doing a volunteer campaign where you're trying to recruit new volunteers for something, it's so important that we're speaking to people from the lens of their previous experience with us, right? When we don't segment lists and we invite people to volunteer in something and we send the same invitation to people who have never volunteered with us before versus somebody who volunteers with us every month with that invitation, they don't feel like they're in the right place. You know, like how many people have gotten an email where you have heard somebody say, or like you've gotten an email and you're like, was this meant for me? Like, I remember recently I got an email from an organization and it was like, thank you so much for being such a long-term invested supporter in our organization. It was like this glowing. And I was like, what organization is this? I was like, I've never even heard of this organization. And I threw their name into my, you know, email account. And it was, oh, I had given to a friend's bike ride that ultimately supported this organization, but I had no personal relationship to the organization. And getting that email really felt like was this meant for me? Like, or did you type my name wrong in the email? You know, and we never, we never want to make people feel that way. And so segmenting your volunteer list based on their previous engagement or their interest in engagement is really, really helpful at making them feel like they're in the right place, that you're talking directly to them. You know, there's a, I often get a question around like, okay, can we automate things inside our system um, doesn't that make it less personal when we automate things inside of our system? And I actually think good when you're using automation, right? And you're using segmentation, it actually allows you to make things a lot more personal. And it allows you to spend a lot more time on the deeper relationship building where you can just set up things that are still speaking to groups of people from their previous history with your organization, from their identity to that, to your organization, but you can still do it in a one-to-many way, but it just and does involve making sure that you're tailoring your communications to the group of folks that you're talking that you're talking to. And another piece of this is not having too much kind of like fluffy language, being clear about what you do, what you care about, the purpose of these different volunteer opportunities. Sometimes we are so afraid of alienating people or we want to be for everyone that we end up being for no one. We end up being really unclear about who we are, what we stand for and what matters most. And what that ends up doing is it doesn't allow people to really know that they're in the right place, right? Because if they're like, well, if this is for everyone, like, is it for me? You know, what makes what makes this the place I want to choose to be? Um, and so the more we're clear about our purpose and our intention and we stand in that with confidence, yeah, sure, that totally means you're not going to be for some people. That's okay. It's going to help the right people say, I'm in the right place. This is my group. These are my people. And that's what really deepens engagement. That's what has volunteers wanting to come back time and time again. And that leads really quickly into, you know, this quote that I use in like everything I do, which is from Seth Godin that I love so much, which is that really what we're all doing all the time subconsciously is identifying, do people like me do things like this? right? We are constantly looking for a connection between the behaviors that we take and our personal identity. And we're looking for validation there, right? Do people like us do things like this? Do people like me volunteer for an organization like yours? Do people like me show up at 8 a.m. on a Saturday morning for that garden work day? Do people like me, you know, spend time at 9 p.m. at night phone banking, and so, so much of how we want to be building these engagement opportunities and these relationships are to consistently remind them for the right people, not everybody, but for the right people that yes, like people like this are doing things like this, and that's going to help them be able to see themselves there too. So I had shared with you before, like, you know, especially around that segmentation piece, but how you could design some of these different strategies for your communities. And these are just sort of like three quick examples of that. 
identifying, starting to identify your segment avatars. So what are the different segments of volunteers, right? That's going to help you build that belonging, build that identity, segment communications, all of those different things. Embrace innovation and A-B test as much as possible. See what lands with different groups. See how your community, your volunteers, and A-B testing is not always a technological thing, right? Like maybe if you're running a thousand volunteer days and you are curious if adding a particular activity is going to increase engagement or retention, Try it with one of your volunteer days or two of your volunteer days and see how that ultimately impacts your volunteer group over time versus the other groups. Like not every change that we make in our organization has to be like this massive change for everyone. You're curious about something. You're like, okay, here's an area where we've really been struggling to deepen engagement or we, we've been struggling to move volunteers from this to this. Think about some ideas that you have to improve that and just test it, try it, see what happens. And then also get, ask your volunteers for feedback, right? I mean, that's a really important part of like building a relationship and engagement, but it also gives you really valuable information. And I want to do one caveat around the volunteer feedback thing. When you do this, you have to be careful to then not design for outliers. So sometimes with feedback, what we find is that the most disgruntled person has the most time for feedback. I don't know how it always works that way, but it always seems to work that way. And so sometimes what happens when we ask for feedback about something is that we get one one piece of feedback or one survey that really hurts our feelings. And one, I just want to like acknowledge and validate that that makes perfect sense that that hurts our feelings. Like, right, it we are pouring our lives and our hearts and everything into putting on these volunteer days, into curating these experiences. And when we get feedback, negative feedback, like it hurts. And that makes total sense. But what happens then is that our brains and our bodies go into protection mode and they're like, okay, like you never want to get this negative feedback again. So don't ever do those things again. But the reality is that like 90% of people actually really liked that thing. And so you really want to be careful when you're asking for volunteer feedback that you're making sure you're getting, you know, that you're not making decisions based on outliers, that you're not making decisions based on that one disgruntled person, that you're making sure you're really getting a wide, you know, variety of, um, of input and that you're looking at the overarching data around things um, because it can just be very very easy for us to attach ourselves to that negative feedback um, and make a lot of decisions without realizing that actually that's not universal or global feedback. Maybe that person really just, they're, they're not in the right place, right? And that's why the more clear we are about who we are and what we stand for and our purpose and all of those things helps us continue to make sure that the right people are there um, and it's okay to not be for everyone. It's okay to not make 100% of people happy all the time. Um, and so I just want to give that <laughs> kind of long caveat to the to the third bullet there. Um, okay, we're going to do a few like summary pieces here and um, and talk for a moment about civic champs also. And then I will leave time at the end for questions um, and a few other things I have for you guys as well. Wow. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was, that was amazing, Mallory. Um, yeah, I, uh, my, my mind is racing in terms of all the things <laughs> that, that, that folks can do. Um, as Mallory mentioned, right. So one of the things we, you know, we wanted to do was just, um, uh, tie it in a little bit in terms of how we think about it here at Civic Champs. You know, I think so much of what Mallory mentioned really resonates with me personally, right? I think, you know, when we created Civic Champs as a product, right, you can see here, you know, we asked for feedback and then, um, you know, she was just talking about this. Um, but I think one of the benefits of a platform like Civic Champs really is, A, you're able to not just get feedback from just that really disgruntled person who really took out that time. <laughs> Right to, to 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 send it to you, but you're actually getting it consistently from a wide range of folks, right? So you're getting this sort of wider perspective. Um, and the other thing is, you know, if we go to the next slide, you can see, you know, one of the things we try to do is try to make the process simple and easy. You know, we talked about the logistics early on, right? And and you know, Mallory mentioned, you know, that's really important, but you know, it's not the thing that makes memories. 
And what we try to do really is we can't make memories from, from, a, from the software side, right? That has to come from you all. And so what we try to do is make the, the logistics kind of disappear as much as possible, right? And so making it really easy for people to schedule, making it very easy for people to uh, check in and check out. So you're seeing the volunteer uh, mobile app right here. They hit a button that says check in. They, you know, they select, you know, the opportunity they're here for, and that's it, right? Keeping it super, super simple. And then of course, right, you're looking at the dashboard, right? You're making it easy for people to um, get all the information that you need. And when Mallory talks about segmenting, right? This is where that segmentation could come in. For example, we could tell you everyone that was happy, everyone that wasn't happy, you know, everyone that was part of this group. And now if you select all, you can message all of them in a sort of very uh, specific manner, right? And so I think, you know, for, for me, um, a lot of what Mallory talks about are things that, you know, frankly, civic champs can't do. That has to come from you all as the leaders of your volunteers. Um, but we try to do all the other pieces, right? And so anyway, I just want to highlight that real quickly. Um, uh, in terms of, you know, how, how we think about it. Um, but yeah, I'll sort of turn it back over to Mallory. We have a couple uh, freebies and whatnot coming up here. And so we can, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll sort of dive in there. Yeah. And I just want to say, I mean, I wish Civic Champs was around when I was leading volunteer work days, you know, seven years ago. And, and just that point, like, I think there's often this conversation around, like, does technology, you know, take us farther away from our people? And I actually think it's the exact opposite for exactly the reasons that Gung was sharing, right? The technology allows you to not be spending your time on these things mm -hmm. that the technology can handle so that you can deepen your your relationships, your communication, all of those things. And then, yeah, to just see it presented in this way is so helpful. It allows you to have those much more personalized touch points and things like that. And I know I was somebody who like in my nonprofit leadership roles was very like tech averse or tech fearful in certain ways because I didn't really understand the role that it could play in actually like creating more human moments and giving me the capacity to do the things Things that the technology cannot do. And so, yes, just to double click on everything you just said. And I love how easy this makes it and how it solves for a lot of the problems that I said. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Which is awesome. Um, okay. So for those of you who are also in fundraising roles as well, or you want to learn more about the Power Partners formula, I'm actually doing a live free masterclass next week on Thursday. It's the last one of 2023. This is my favorite everybody's favorite signature masterclass. And if you go to malloryerickson.com backslash free, you can sign up. I go through the whole blueprint there mm -hmm. as well. I talk a lot about the biggest myths that we hold around fundraising. And so I know that volunteer engagement and fundraising are often you know, either in, in the same department or working closely together, you're constantly trying to figure out sort of how to work. So either for you or the fundraiser on your team, if it isn't you, um, this is going to be a really great, a really great um, time together. And then I just want to go over before we move to questions, some like high level summary, since we talked about a lot in the last 45 minutes together, we started off talking about the relationship between how you feel and what you think that cognitive behavior loop and how that is so fundamental to your ability to mm -hmm. build these real and deeper relationships with your volunteers. We talked about the different energy levels that show up and how those impact, again, your connection and the that energy is contagious um, and what your volunteers sort of subconsciously are looking for above all else and looking to be validated in their mm -hmm. engagement with you if they're going to come back again and again. And again, this is all about engagement and how you deepen those relationships and then how you can design strategies that are specific to your community, segmenting, integrating their perspectives, speaking to them where they're at. Um, so I just wanted to make sure since we talked about so many different pieces of this that I gave that summary. Um, and then here are our contact informations as well. If you want to connect with us, uh, email, website, LinkedIn, Instagram, all the different, all the different pieces. Um, and uh, I'll go to this too before we go we go into questions. You can take a picture of that or or screenshot that if you want to. Um, and then we can move into questions. But I don't know, Gung, if you want to talk about this first. Sure. Yeah, just as a um, 
uh, a little bit of a treat from our end, right? So um, we uh, we love it when people come to our webinars. And so hopefully this encourages more people to join, but uh, we wanted us to just offer a little bit of a discount for everyone here on the webinar today um, as one of our freebies. Um, and so, uh, so read, you know, before September 7th, you know, we're, we're offering a 25% discount. So you can book time with me on that link right there uh, to, to redeem that. Um, if you're interested, if you think, you know, Civic Champs could be helpful, uh, love to connect. Um, and then, you know, we have one other freebie, which is we just released uh, and published uh, as of, I think, today. So this is like fresh off the, the press. Uh, we have our first ebook that we are publishing at Civic Champ. So uh, we'll actually send this out as part of the follow-up e email that we're going to send you all. Um, but it's uh, it's sort of a comprehensive guide to volunteer management. Um, it talks about, uh, you know, the you know, six different uh, main components of volunteer management and how you might want to think about them. Um, we'll continue to put out more content uh, like this webinar. Webinar, but also more ebooks and, and, and guides. Um, and so if you're interested in our webinars, uh, we do have a couple upcoming ones. Uh, so on the 17th, uh, we're going to be connected with um, our friends at Memory Fox. They have a fantastic tool that allows you to collect images and content uh, directly from your constituents, from your volunteers or donors, and really have this sort of grassroots led uh, marketing material that you can leverage at any time. And so we're going to talk about that. Um, and then on August 24th, uh, we have one of the sort of premier uh, volunteer management experts with uh, Beth Steinhorn. Some of you may have her, uh, you know, heard her speak before, um, but she's with BQ Volunteer Strategies, and she's going to talk about volunteer recruitment, some of the basics, and then some of the more advanced, um, you know, elements of, of volunteer recruitment. We know that is the number one topic that comes up in terms of what is it on the you know sort of top of mind in terms of volunteer managers these days. Um, you know, obviously we've seen a dip in the volunteer numbers, uh, even post COVID, we just haven't quite gotten our programs back to where they were. And so recruiting, I know is top of mind for a lot of folks. So really encourage you to sign up for that. And we have some links here in the chat that, uh, that, you know, Chloe's putting in there. And so, uh, feel free to uh, take a look, um, with that, you know, we'll, uh, we'll leave our, uh, uh, you know, contact information here, but we'll sort of open it up to uh, questions, which I think the first one we we did, we answered already with Tracy's question. So uh, there's there's our contact. But yeah, if, if folks have any questions, um, yeah, please put that in the chat. Uh, but we'll also, you know, sort of scan through, you know, one, one question I saw from earlier, Mallory, I don't know if you have a uh, good answer to this, right? In terms of a, what you know, what's a good job description for volunteers? Oh, I mean, that really depends on what the volunteer role actually is, right? Like, I mean, we, I was talking about volunteer engagement in a very broad way, but when we're talking about volunteers, it can be everything from, you know, a one-time like work day that recruits a lot of people together versus somebody who's volunteering a certain amount of hours a week to sort of fill in a fractional staff role um, that that your organization doesn't have. I think, you know, this is a general recommendation around job descriptions for volunteers in general, which is just like being really transparent with them around what the role really entails and what mm. the support structure around it really entails. I think that tends to be the biggest disconnect often is like, how much support there will be for that volunteer in the role versus, especially when we're talking about um, volunteering that involves kind of fractional support. Um, and, and that it's just really clear, like, is this this type of thing that the volunteer is going to work closely with a staff member on that they're going to be given a lot of feedback or professional development around what are sort of the, the benefits or outcomes for that volunteer as well, versus are you looking for somebody who's going to kind of come in, hit the ground running, is an expert in this area and can give you two hours a week mm. to solve a problem that the organization has. So I think really being clear about sort of the skill set that the person needs to have to do the volunteer workday, what the benefits or to do the volunteer opportunity, what the benefits of the volunteer opportunity for them are, and what the support mm. is going to look like around the volunteer and sort of how they fit in structurally to the organization. Um, and then the outcomes, of course, on the organization itself are really helpful 
people and helping them or understand why that volunteering matters. But those are like four general buckets in addition to like the actual pieces of that specific job that you're talking about that I tend to think about. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I um, um, I often think about an experience I had growing up, which is I volunteered at the nursing home and passing out water to seniors Right. But, you know, I thought that was like not very impactful, but had they reframed it and said, hey, you know, this is uh, this is really about the micro moments, right, of, of the social engagement, right, that could have been more more motivating. Um, and we have a question here um, in chat as well in terms of, um, you know, the lead volunteer coordinator at my shelter being extremely burnt out and waiting for a chance to leave. I don't know how I could have played a role to keep him in his role and actually cause me to leave as well. What do you think, Mallory? Any tips? Yeah, I mean, this is a very big question. And I talk about burnout a lot, um, especially on what the fundraising, I bring in a lot of um, therapists, psychologists, behavioral scientists, um, who talk about, you know, burnout in deeper ways than we typically talk about it inside the nonprofit sector. So there's a great um, episode on how to heal your nervous system on, on there. And, um, and, like, I think, you know, one of the things that we often think about burnout is that it is, okay, people just need a week off, right? Or like they need a little PTO or they need, um, you know, a break. But usually what's causing burnout is this chronic stress state in their current role. So maybe the first thing I want to say, Angeli, is like, it is not your fault that this person left. And I don't want to pathologize a sector wide challenge that we're facing to like individuals. And so I think like, I, I don't think that there's anything you individually could have done that could have like saved this whole situation necessarily, because I don't want to put that on you. And I don't think that's an unfair thing to say that like, yeah, you could have done X, Y, and Z and, and that person wouldn't left like burnout you know, can be something that's happening from years and years of chronic stress in a certain role. It's not always solvable in, in, mm. you know, the moment like that. But I do think as a sector and inside our organizations, we do need to be thinking holistic, more holistically about how we solve for burnout in terms of healing and decreasing chronic stress, as opposed to like run, 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 burnout. Now you have a break. Um, and so I think like understanding for people, like creating more spaces where people can talk about what's leading them to chronic stress, what's leading them to feeling trapped, what are the things that are happening in their roles that are um, are making them feel a sense of choicelessness, which is often what keeps us trapped in a chronic stress state, helping them flex their autonomy where they can, um, and and. And really one of the simplest things that we can all do to help each other with our stress is to acknowledge and validate how we feel. Um, you know, we think like we can like tough love ourselves through it or like, oh, you know, could be worse or like at least it's not in the middle of COVID, you know, like all those things. And actually those, that type of language keeps us more in a chronic stress state than acknowledge and validating how we feel. And then talking about what it would look like, what we need to heal and what we need to um, to, you know, be able to essentially like down regulate our nervous system, um, into a more grounded state, which is a very big, like there's a PhD in there somewhere. Um, but I hope that gives like a few, a few nuggets of, should you face this in the future, both for yourselves or for any of you in your environments, these are some of the components that I really think about. And we talk about a lot inside power partners. So Joshua just had a question about C6 versus C3 volunteerism and the challenge of getting those personal connections when we are industry focused rather than save the whales heartstrings activated. Any mm. thoughts on activating folks who are part of an industry as a C6? I actually don't. What do you know what that I don't think I know what that means enough. Like a, uh, I think I think he, Joshua is part of a like a uh, like a trade group, a trade association. Oh, okay. Like a uh, a tech uh, tech tech industry, you know, supporting tech in in, in you know in, in your state or supporting the real estate sector, you know, one of those uh, industry associations. 
Yeah. Okay. So, and those in, and those associations are volunteering as a group with your organization. And so you're trying to figure out sort of how you deepen engagement with these groups that maybe aren't personally identifying themselves initially as aligned with the volunteer opportunity. I think that's what, is that right? Um, if I remember, I think Josh, Josh, I, I think I, uh, I uh, got to meet him in the past. He's, um, he's part, he is the trade association. So they are a, they are the C6. And so maybe, you know, how do you engage your membership, if you will? Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Okay. That's, thank you for clarifying that for me. So obviously to answer your first question, Josh, this is not something I have personal experience with. Um, but I think at the end of the day, the a lot of those pillars that we talked about are the same and so the first thing that i would actually think about is like what is their incentive in being involved in the association or potentially be more involved in the association like what is the alignment between how you want these people to volunteer for the association and what they might be looking for in their personal or professional lives because my guess is there is some level of overlap there there's something that you need or want in terms of volunteer engagement that aligns with what the folks in your association need and want in terms of their personal and professional lives. And if you don't know what that is right now, I would start with having some conversations about that and just like maybe identifying a few people who, you know, maybe have responded to a survey here or responded to an email and just having an open dialogue with them and saying, hey, you know, I'm really looking to build out a volunteer engagement program around this association. Here are some of the ideas that I've had around how people might be interested in being engaged. What do you think about that? Does that resonate with you? Does that fill a gap in your personal or professional life? Like what would make it appealing? Have you ever volunteered in it for an association before? What felt good about that? What didn't feel good about that? And really start to let your community design what the engagement could look like for you. Well said. I, uh, yeah, no, that's great. Hopefully, yeah, hopefully, Josh, that that that's that's helpful. Um, any other questions from from the crew? Otherwise, you know, we we're uh, uh, just a few minutes from from the hour, um, and so I guess uh, you know, I I just want to say thank you again, Mallory, for for coming today for this webinar. Um, it was super super informative. I I feel like I learned a lot, so hopefully that's true for everyone else here on the call too. Um, we're gonna send out a, a follow up for everyone, uh, both with in terms of slides. Um, and also a recording of the of the webinar itself, so folks can sort of uh, you know re refresh their, their memories in terms of what was said. Um, and again, uh, encourage everyone to join us again next week or the following. Um, and yeah, thanks for uh, coming in again, and uh, thank you again, Mallory. Uh, super appreciative. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And one thing I'll just say, Josh, I'm gonna add one quick thing for everybody that like the what you don't have in your volunteer opportunity is like a level four helper maybe volunteer opportunity but you definitely have that level five win-win opportunity mutual benefit so you don't have to have for anyone else on this webinar that like heart string mm. helper opportunity to have a valuable and meaningful volunteer opportunity but it is about figuring out wh what does the mutual benefit look like at that level five leadership and how can you design around that alignment point so I just want to, after I finished talking, I was like, wait, there's one more thing, but thank you for that. <laughs> thank you for having me. Um, so great to be with all of you and thank you for the work that you do. It's so incredibly important and I'm really grateful um, to you. Well, with that, we'll sign off. Thanks everyone.